Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you tonight. Appreciate you coming out this way and uh, looking forward to getting back into our study. Certainly thank the Lord for the opportunity to open his word and study together again tonight. And uh, just appreciate the fact that we've got God's word here in our own language that we can read for ourselves and study Amen. together. And uh, we can just stand up here without doubt as to what we have before us and just let it be known what thus saith the Lord. Amen. 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 That's what we're going to try to do tonight. And we're going to continue our series, Israel, My Glory. And I'm going to call you to Deuteronomy chapter 32 to get underway this evening. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I've already stated, looking forward to getting back into the study this week. Of course, had a break, a little bit of a break last week. And I'm thankful for that time. I think it did us all well just to take a break and uh, kind of fell at a good time with the series and, and how we're looking at things. And so I uh, appreciate the the, the, uh, the pause and the time away, but time now once again to fire it up again and lay another doctrinal brick on the wall that we're trying to construct here as we're looking at God's program with Israel. And um, hopefully got one for you tonight that as we start looking at a, a same subject, but a little bit different angle of the subject as we're approaching uh, the Gospels. And um, of course, we want to continue to look at the Gospels. Obviously, Deuteronomy is not one of the Gospels where I've called you to first, um, but there are some things in the Gospels ultimately that we're trying to get to at this point in our study, and we're looking at what we're calling this Gospel period, the fourth installment of that fifth course of punishment. And um, I think that uh, those of you that have been with us understand what we mean by that at this point, but roughly speaking, the time that's covered by the gospel records of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what we've done to this point in our consideration of the gospels is that we've looked at the overall doctrinal role and function that Matthew through John has as it relates to a presentation of Christ to Israel. I had a fourfold presentation of the Christ to Israel, and the aim of the gospels is that very thing, presenting Christ to Israel as their Messiah and their king. And um, there were four ways that the prophets had told the nation they need to behold him. And that's what we've been looking at in the gospel so far. Well, they were to behold him as we have here on our board, behold him as the king, as the servant, as man, and as God. Right? That was set forth back there in the prophets so that when he comes, they're to behold him in those four ways. And those four presentations of the Christ is what the gospel record set forth in that order, of course, the king corresponding to Matthew's witness, the servant to Mark, the man to Luke, and God is the witness of the Apostle John in his gospel. And we've tried to summarize that a little bit and look at some scriptures within those texts that uh, illustrate that reality of what their doctrinal role and objective is as it relates to the presentation of Christ to Israel. And as we're thinking about the gospels and the doctrinal sense and sequence of God's word, my present understanding is that there is a, a progressive doctrinal development even within this unit of the Gospels, okay? What I mean by that is that Matthew is the first that you come to in the Bible, right? If you're just looking at the 66 books in our Bible, as you turn the page out of Malachi, Matthew is the first Gospel that you're presented with, doctrinally speaking, in the biblical order, Okay? Matthew, I understand that to come first because Matthew lays down some of the doctrinal foundation of, uh, but excuse me, doctrinal foundational things that you need to get established in your thinking as it relates to the Gospels as a whole, right? You've got foundation in Matthew, and then you've got Mark, Luke, and John who follow that up, and they're going to start building up and building out on those doctrinal foundations that Matthew was laying down. And so there's a sense and sequence, so to speak, even in the doctrinal development of the way that the Gospels are laid out. And uh, again, I, when I'm talking about that ordering, I'm talking about a doctrinal perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand that what I'm saying does not necessarily correspond to the chronological order in which it's commonly believed that those Gospels were written. Mm -hmm. Right? As to say that, you know, Matthew was probably not the first Gospel that was written down by inspiration of God. Could have been, could not have been. Take sources for what they say. But the general consensus after you, when you read after people is that Matthew's probably not the earliest of those four. But it is the first in a doctrinal sequence as you're working your way through a biblical order. Okay, mm -hmm. So I'm talking about the doctrinal order 
when I'm talking about this foundational thing uh, with uh, progressive building upon it, and, and Matthew sets down some of those foundational details. You know, when you talk about the Gospels, the Gospel that uh, Christianity today seems to love the most is probably the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. right, a lot of uh, preaching and teaching comes out of the Gospel of John. People will just hand out the Gospel of John. Sometimes oh, yeah. it's John and Romans that are paired together. And I understand why they do that, because John has a lot to say about belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and um, the, a lot of ways that if you're, you're not paying attention necessarily to the, the context and the objective, where you could read some of Paul's doctrine back in there. Yes, you know, and that, that's the way that it's typically viewed. Uh, but really, John, if you're, if you're looking at the doctrinal ordering of the Gospels, John's not the first one that you're presented with in the biblical order. John's fourth of four, last in the list. Right, And that would tell me that if I'm working through a doctrinal order, the things I'm reading in John are actually founded on things that I've come through in Matthew, Mark, and Luke already. And the, the, the kingdom message is very prominent in Matthew and also even in Mark and Luke. And then when John's coming along talking about faith and the Messiah and dealing with things related to that, that's all founded back on that same doctrine, that kingdom doctrine that you got in those earlier Gospels. And so there's a sense and sequence to it, at least as I understand it at present, in the way that the Holy Ghost is meaning to uh, communicate his truth in this section that we refer to as the Gospels. And Matthew is my understanding that serves as the foundation for those things. And so I say all that to say that based on that understanding of a doctrinal sense and sequence of the Gospels, what I would like to do as we get into this fourth installment and start diving into some of the details of the gospel period and the ministry of the Lord is that we're going to kind of look at this section collectively by focusing the majority of our attention in the upcoming weeks on Matthew's gospel. All right, we'll go to some other places in the others, but looking at some of the details of Matthew's gospel, I think if we do that, then we'll have the foundation for what's covered in the rest. And that's really what we're trying to achieve with this study anyway. Is just look at some of those uh, those highlight matters and get enough of the the um, the highlights for the section, and then you can uh, build that out on your own as you study on your own time. But Matthew's where we're going to be working toward and uh, looking at Matthew's details and what he sets forth. And I told you a few weeks ago when we were looking at Matthew that Matthew's presentation is thematic in nature, meaning that while he's presenting Christ as the King of Israel. There's also some sub-themes, so to speak, within his gospel that he works through. And he doesn't necessarily concern himself with laying everything out in a chronological order, but he picks, and the Holy Spirit has him pick, certain details and events and miracles from the life and ministry of the Lord that are potent for emphasizing the, the theme that he's dealing with in a certain section of his book. And so we're going to be seeing some themes in Matthew coming up. And uh, one of the themes that I'd like to start dealing with tonight and really take a step back and kind of lay a foundation for is one of the things that I think that we see playing out beginning with Matthew and also with some of the other gospels and even on into uh, the time following the cross and to the end of the program, really, this theme is going to be coming up. And the thing that I'm referring to that we want to look at uh, in the fourth installment is the theme of Christ, the rock or stone of Israel. Right, Christ, the rock, of Israel. And I think that we'll be able to see some things in Matthew and other passages that illustrate that. And we're going to deal with the details of that as Matthew sets it forth and, and really lay that on the foundation of some things that were set forth in those Old Testament scriptures prior to the Gospels. Okay, And so that's what we're going to be doing in the upcoming weeks. Tonight, my objective is to go back to the Old Testament, establish the theme for you, make sure that we understand where it's coming from, and then we'll be able to come back and build upon that um, either next week or the week following, depending on how long it, it takes us to get through this. And so we're going to be in the Old Testament again tonight, but it's serving as foundation for this fourth installment and the Gospels. And so I've called you back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, and I do that because I want to begin this subject of Christ, the Rock of Israel, by uh, allowing you to see the Old Testament association that gets made in relation to a nation's rock. All right, what does that mean? Well, I think we have some verses here in Deuteronomy 32 and actually quite a few references to the rock in this passage. And there's uh, quite a few verses that we'll come back a little bit later on 
in the message tonight and look at in particular. But right now what I want to do is kind of read some of the verses of this chapter and kind of jump around a little bit and just show you these references to the rock so that we can see this association that's getting established here early on in God's word. Okay, so look at Deuteronomy 32, if you will. And we'll begin reading here in verse number one. Moses, of course, is writing here at the end of the 40 years, addressing the generation that's been raised in the wilderness prior to entering the land. And the Holy Spirit has Moses say this to the nation of Israel. Verse one, he says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He's talking about his purpose with Israel here, to have his name published in all the earth. And he's doing that through this people. And he says, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Israel's God, the Lord, Jehovah. Now verse 4, look at, look at what is said of this God. He says, he is the rock. The Lord is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So we see association here right off the bat that God is associated with the rock. Israel's God in particular here. Is called the rock, a God of truth and without iniquity. He is the rock of Israel. Skip down to verse 15. He says, Majeshurin waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Right? The rock of salvation is the Lord. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods who they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Right? So Israel went after the idols of the Gentiles. Verse 18, he says, of the rock that begat thee, Thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Look at uh, verse 30. He says, How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? Verse 31, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. And then verse 37 and 38. It says, And he shall say, Where are their gods? Their rock in whom they trusted, which should eat the fat of their sacrifices and drink the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. So multiple references to the rock here in Deuteronomy 32. You can see that there's references to the rock as referencing the Lord, the God of Israel, right? The true rock, the rock that begat Israel, he says. But that association of the rocks also tied to these idols also, isn't it? I think a key point on that there is uh, verse 31, talking about these gods of the Gentiles, these idols that they turn to. He says, for their rock is not as our rock. Right, so, so both across the spectrum, the true God and all these idols, there's this association that's being made with rocks. A nation's rock uh -huh. is their God or their gods. Yeah, he talks about foundation. He talks about uh, refuge and protection and that type of thing. But when you talk about the rock of a nation, you're talking about the God in whom they trust. That's where they put their faith, then the rock. Absolutely. And so we see this in the, uh, this association. A nation's God or gods is their rock. The Lord is the rock of Israel. He's the one in whom they are to trust as their strength, as their protection, as a nation. Whereas those Gentiles, their rock is a rock of vanity. They trust in idols. 
But nevertheless, that's their rock. That's where they're putting their faith. That's what they're building their house upon, so to speak. The rock of their idols. And really, when you read the context of Deuteronomy 32 here, the scathing prophetic rebuke that Moses is giving to the nation of Israel is for the fact that as he's looking forward to what's coming, as they get into the land, his rebuke of them is going to be that Israel, they have forsaken their rock and placed their trust in the rock of these Gentiles. They've gone after the idols of the Gentiles. They sacrificed to the devils, to these new gods that came up and been carried away. The rock that begat them, they're unmindful. They forsake the Lord. They turn quickly out of the way. And instead of building their national house on the rock, the Lord, they opt for the rock of these idols. And he's indicted them for it ahead of time. Here in Deuteronomy 32, as he looks prophetically at what they're going to do once they get in that land. And that's, that's the indictment that he's after here. They put their trust in a rock of vanity, just like the Gentiles do. So we can see this concept of the rock of the nation's gods. Look at a few other passages on this just to show you that this theme continues throughout the scripture. Uh, jump over to 1 Samuel, if you will. And in this case, we're looking at the rock in association with the Lord in particular. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and this is, of course, getting into the time of the life of Samuel. This is his mother, Hannah, and she is uh, praying here. In 1 Samuel 2, and I'll look at what, what she says and some of the things here, just observe as we read it, that's associated with this reference to the Lord. 1 Samuel 2, and verse 1. It says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. Verse 2. She says, there is none holy as the Lord, Jehovah. For there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. It's none holy as the Lord. Amen. There's none set apart, right? The, the idea is that the Lord is holy. He's separate. He's above all the gods of the nations. Amen. We've got our adversaries and our enemies, but there's none holy as the Lord. There's none beside thee, she says, and neither is there any rock like our God. There's some other rocks out there, but there's none like our rock, the Lord. He's the rock of Israel. Second Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23. Here we're fast forwarding into the life of David. Actually what's called here the last words of David. 2 Samuel 23 and verse number 1. He says, Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, The man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. He goes on there and says some other things, but you see verse 3 there. The God of Israel said, And the rock of Israel spake to me. Right? God associated with this concept of the rock. All right, let's go to the book of Psalms. The 18th Psalm. Psalms 18. Verse 1. Actually, you've got a superscription here that's kind of important as it relates to the subject we're looking at. So we'll read that. Psalm 18 there in the heading, it says, The chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul, and he said. All right, so in the context of deliverance, David is speaking this. And he says in verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. 
and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Verse 31, he says, For who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? Association with the rock. Then there's a lot of other passages, but just jump over to one more, and we'll go to Psalm 92. Just looking for the association here, how it's repeated, uh, repeatedly associated that the rock of a nation is their God, and for Israel, that is to be the Lord. Psalm 92, verse 13 the psalmist says, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Why? To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Right? Just profuse references associating the Lord to the rock, the God of Israel to the rock. And so you see this association is true of the Lord. It's true of the idols of the Gentiles, the nation's God or gods is their rock, okay? Now, aside from that simple and clear association that you can see from just reading of a rock being associated with the nation's God, another important point about the rock is the reason why those associations are made. Why would a God or gods be considered a nation's rock? Well, I think part of the reason for that is that some of the physical features of rocks can equate to spiritual realities about the source, strength, and salvation of the God in which a nation trusts. You take, for instance, you just think about a rock. And I'm not talking about a little stone. I'm talking about like a, a boulder type of rock. A rock's a pretty solid object, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You think of stability when you think of these large and massive rocks that are out there in nature. You go into the mountains and you see these humongous rocks and great weight. You can't just go up to those and, and push them over or roll them down the hill. They don't move. You can push and push and push, and you can push it all day and spend all your energy on it, and yet the rock never moves, does it? It's a solid object. Rocks are associated with stability. They're steadfast, not easily moved with the vicissitudes of the environment. Right? You've got storms that come along sometimes. And out there in the environment, the storm is it's rocking and, and reeling, and the, the trees are, are swaying back and forth, and some of them snap off. You've got objects that are flying around and picked up by the wind, and yet these large, massive rocks are just steadfast there in the midst of the storm, and the storm comes and goes, and it wreaks its havoc, and it blows away, and yet the rock is still there steadfast and sure, yeah. like it always was. It's stable. Amen. And that feature of rocks is oftentimes why rocks are associated with safety and protection and even physical salvations when those storms and adverse circumstances are going on. Many times in the Bible, you'll talk, it'll talk about the holes of the rocks in the context of a place of refuge. When the storm's going on, the, the, the endangered soul can flee into the holes of the rocks to find the shelter. Yeah, in the cleft of the rock. And in the holes of the rocks, you can flee there. And you go there because that's a safe place. That's a protected place. A place you don't have to, be, have to be worried about being moved with the storm. And you can ride out the storm there in the hole of the rock. It, it's safety and protection and security and even a physical salvation, in a sense, right? It, it, it saves you from being destroyed by the physical storm. Amen. And when you think about that in the context of these nations, Israel and the Gentiles, and all of the, uh, the, the warfare that's talked about back here in the Old Testament, right? Conquests and these empires that are coming to power and moving across great land masses with great speed and captivating people and expanding their reach. Right? Wars on every side, in a sense, Dangers on every side, and these people in that, that, that world in which they're living and, and what's described back there, they're surrounded by dangers on every side that threaten their safety and quietness as a people. They've got enemies that are coming in against them, and it was not uncommon to see these various peoples calling upon and placing their trust in the God or gods that they believe were protecting them from these dangers and from their enemies that were without in the context of battles and adversaries, and that type of thing. Their God was their rock. 
their place of safety and salvation in a sense, or at least the one to whom they ascribed those things. And the one they believed was the author of their protection. That's why as an example, when Nebuchadnezzar, a Gentile king, comes into Jerusalem and he sacks the city of Jerusalem there, and he's taking the people of Israel away captive at the start of this fifth course of punishment. When he comes in there, he takes the vessels out of the house of the Lord there, the temple in Jerusalem, and what's he do with them? He takes them back to Babylon, and he puts them in the house of his God. Why is he doing that? He believes his God is the one that has given him good success and victory as he's gone against Jerusalem. Describing greatness and paying tribute to his God, so to speak. And you can see this in other passages in the, the um, Old Testament scriptures. You know, in Judges, you've got uh, the Philistines with, uh, was it Dagon? Right? They, they uh, ascribe their victory there. And, and multiple examples you can go through there as you're looking at the history. But oftentimes, when they had military successes, they would give these offerings of tribute to their God because right, that's their rock. That's the one they find success in. That's who they're placing their trust in. That's who they believe is the author of their protection and giving them success and defending them off, uh, defending off their enemies and so forth. There was their rocks their place of protection, or at least what they believed to be. Now, while we know that those gods of the nations were truly no gods to protect them, there was a true rock in Israel, wasn't there? Israel's got the light of the true and living God. Israel's got the knowledge of the Lord and the oracles of God, as they're called. They know that the Lord liveth, He's not as these other gods that have hands that cannot work and eyes that cannot see. Right? As Hannah said, there's none like thee. The living God is the God of Israel. He's our rock. Yeah. And their rock's not like our rock. Amen. She'll say. There's a true rock in Israel who, unlike those vanities of the Gentiles, was of power and of might to be Israel's hiding place and their defense and their fortress from their enemies there in the midst of that land as they were going into it. The Lord's the rock of Israel. He's the one that promised to prosper their way and to drive out their enemies. He's the one that promised them good success and said that he would go before them. And when their enemies rise up against them, the Lord would be their protection and their, their safe haven. They could run into him as a fortress and as a deliverer and as a strong tower in the midst of the onslaught of their enemies and find safety and protection because the Lord said, I'll be for you if you keep my laws. Amen. He was the rock. He's the true rock. And therefore you find Israel speaking of him often in that context and with that terminology, describing him as the source and strength and salvation of his people. I want to look at a few other references uh, to this. If you will, go back to Psalms uh, 18. Look at the first two verses a minute ago. And I want to look at those verses again, but look at them with eyes now that are thinking in the context of their refuge and safety and deliverance and salvation, that type of thing. Because yeah. that's the way that the rock comes up as they're describing him. Again, in the context of David's deliverance from Saul, verse 1 of Psalm 18, he says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength, the strength of the rock. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, the one I run into to find fortification, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will put my trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. You see all those terms of safety and deliverance and protection there? Tied to the rock. And because the Lord is that true rock, verse 3 says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Mm. I'm not calling upon the idle and vain rocks of the Gentiles. I'm calling upon the Lord because his name is worthy to be praised. I place my confidence and my faith in him. And what's the result of that? Amen. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. I'm going to be Amen. saved. Salvation. Deliverance, a hiding place, that fortress that he was just describing. And David says, I love the Lord because of that. He's a strong stay in the midst of my enemies. Look at uh, verse 30 again. He says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to those that trust in him. His, his word's reliable. You see his word associated with a rock. That's a sure foundation. What he says can be relied upon. 
as a God of truth. Verse 31, for who is God save the Lord and who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that the bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy right hand hath holden me up and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded uh, me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hated me. The psalmist is describing good success in military conflict, salvation, physical deliverance, a hiding place from his enemies. The rock is describing the Lord as such. Look at verse 46. That's a good verse. The psalmist says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me, and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to the, his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed to David, and to his seed forevermore. All right, there's, there's a ton of other verses in the Psalm series you read through there where the same type of thing is being talked about. The, the reference to him as the rock in the context of protection and deliverance and safety and good success. The nation's God is their rock, and that's because he's their sure footing, their salvation, their protection. That's the doctrine of the rock. Strength, safety, and salvation is found in a nation's rock, and that's to be the Lord. For Israel. The Lord is the rock of Israel. Now with those general principles about the rock and those associations in our thinking now, I want us to think back more particularly to how this concept of Jehovah as the rock of Israel began to be developed in Israel's understanding very early on after God delivered them and brought them out of Egypt. Because God starts teaching them this very early on. And I want us to go back to Exodus 17. Exodus chapter 17. Here in Exodus 17, we find the children of Israel in this window of time where they're in the wilderness testings. Mm -hmm. This is after they've crossed the Red Sea, but prior to coming to Mount Sinai. Right? So there's this window of time between those two events where the Lord has them out there in the wilderness and he's taking them through this education and who he is as the Lord and who they are as a people and their definite need for him to be the things for them that they can't be for themselves. And in the context of that, the Lord is, is doing some great works among them. Okay, At this point in Exodus 17, Israel has not only witnessed the great power of the Lord back in Egypt with the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, but they've seen the Lord provide for them there at the bitter waters of Marah. The trees cast in, the bitter waters turn sweet. So they have something to drink to quench their thirst. At this point, they had seen the Lord provide quail and manna for them to satisfy their hunger. Amen. And now they've come to Rephidim where they begin to chide and tempt the Lord with a question of unbelief, as you see it at the end of verse 7 there. Is the Lord among us or not? After all he's shown them, this is the question that they're chiding and tempting him over. Is the Lord really among us or not? Is he all that he says he is? Because we're out here in the middle of the desert and we have nothing to drink. All right, so it's in that context here that the Lord is going to provide for his people in the wilderness. He's going to give them water to drink once again. He has a chosen method in which he's going to do that. And the way that he's going to provide the water for them there in the desert is through the means of a rock. Okay. I want to pick up here in the middle of verse 5 where the Lord's giving instruction to Moses on what he's to do to address this problem of thirst. 
Exodus 17, 5, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thy hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Oreb. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Mesa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And so the Lord performed a great miracle here, hadn't he? Right? He's, he's given Moses instruction to take that rod that he sent him to Egypt with, that same rod, he says, and he says, I want you to smite this rock and water is going to come out of it. Great miracle of the Lord. A lot of water, too. Yeah, and a lot of water. Yeah, the, the, I think it's the Psalms describes it as sent forth rivers in the desert, giving water to approximately two million Jews, probably. But he does it through a rock. Great and mighty miracle of the Lord demonstrating his power here. And, and in addition to this literal, physical miracle of provision, there's a spiritual truth nested within that that the Lord is seeking to establish in his nation's thinking from the very outset of his dealing with them as a nation of people on their way to the land. And it's, it's got to do with uh, teaching them about this spiritual conflict of who the Lord is as their rock. The Lord is their rock. And you think about it, smiting of a rock and having water come out of that. That's not normal, is it? Normally, rocks do not produce water, okay? Now, yeah, it was a literal rock. Yes, it was literal water that quenched the thirst of literal people. But it's so interesting that the way the Lord describes this miracle and what the Lord is doing in connection with this physical event that's playing out before their eyes. Because when you look at verse 6, notice what he says. When he's given Moses instructions there, the Lord is speaking here, and he says, Behold... I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Hmm. And then he tells him to smite the rock. So when Moses takes the physical rod and smites the physical rock, according to that verse, where is the Lord's position when that's taking place? Amen. On the rock. See, rocks don't produce water, folks. The where the water came from is from the God that was there upon the rock. Amen. What's the spiritual truth and lesson he's teaching them? Their source of provision comes from him. Amen. He's the source of living water. He's the source of their provision. Amen. They need to come to, to build their, their trust and their faith and their house upon the Lord as their rock because that's where their salvation is found. Amen. It's in him. Amen. I'm standing there upon the rock, he says. That's the source of their salvation. You know, the Apostle Paul understood that about this passage. Because he talks about it. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10, he's talking about this event over there. And he makes reference to it in this issue of the rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 1. First Corinthians 10, 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. He says, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them yeah. and that rock was Christ. Amen. That rock was Christ. Christ is the rock of Israel. Yes, Jehovah is the rock of Israel. That, it's the name I am that he's teaching them back there. But what we know from John is that when Jesus Christ came on the scene, right, the last message we looked at, he came full of grace and truth. Jehovah God, the creator God, manifest in human flesh. Jesus Christ is the rock of Israel. Amen. That's their God among them. It's the message of John. Paul's calling it out, right? That, that rock was Christ. 
Christ was on that rock back there when that event took place. When the rock was smitten, he was there. And the spiritual truth that's taught in that is that he is the source and strength of their salvation. Amen. He's the rock of Israel. And so we see this concept being taught to them very early on. All right, this is just a little while after he's brought them out of Egypt. One of the first things first matters, so to speak, before they ever get to the land, before they ever go under the law, before they ever do any of that stuff that took place in the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings there, very early on, he's teaching them and beginning to cultivate this understanding with them through a physical object lesson that I, the Lord, am the rock of Israel. I'm your safety. I'm your protection. I'm your source of provision. It's all found in me. Build your house on me. Place your faith in me as Jehovah, your God. I'm your rock. That's what begins to be taught to them. He's their strength, stability, and salvation. Now, even though that's the truth, and that's what the Lord wanted to be for his people, Israel demonstrated through their history that they had a hard time coming to understand that and trusting that, didn't they? Right, God wanted to be that for them from the very beginning. He taught them that from the very beginning. But as the stiff-necked people that they were, they had a very, very hard time coming to learn that spiritual truth and rely upon it. Rather than trusting him as their rock and building their national house on it, rather than building all their kingdom hope on him and his name, what do they end up doing? They forget their rock. They're unmindful of their rock, as Moses will tell them. And they leave that sure and true rock and begin to try to start building on these other rocks that they can see out there among the Gentiles. And to their shame, they look for a foundation of safety and strength and salvation and they placed their hope in what was truly nothing more than a foundation of sand in which their house was not going to stand. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And that's what Moses prophetically was talking about in Deuteronomy 32. I want us to go back there, read through that in totality, and just watch, watch the way he's talking about this because the Lord is their rock. He wants to be that for them, but they have this problem, as we've seen demonstrated throughout all these courses of punishment, that they're continually going after other rocks, other foundations to build their kingdom hope and house on. They've gone under the law at this point. Moses knows they're going to fail, and he's telling them about it. Deuteronomy 32, verse 1. He says, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. That's what he wanted to be for them. He says, but they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children, they are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath brought, uh, bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? See, he's the reason they even exist. But yet they turn away. Verse 7, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee. Thy elders and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Right, they're the centerpiece of God's purpose on earth. Verse 9, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in a waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Mm -hmm. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. See all the things he did for him? There wasn't any gods, plural, with him doing that. The Lord alone did that, he says. 
Verse 13, he made him to ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields and made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep with the fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of the kidneys of wheat. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Blessed him, prospered him. The Lord did all that for him. But in blessing them, it says, but Jeshurun waxed fat. They got fat on the blessings of God and they kicked. Thou art waxing fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. When they were fat and flourishing, it says, then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Turned away from the true rock of salvation. And they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Why did they do that? Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Started in their thinking, didn't it? They forget where God brought them from. They were unmindful of it. They were not allowing his word to reside in their mind and renew their mind and to, to draw them to the Lord. They weren't building their foundation wisely on the foundation of his word. Cast it behind their back, forgot about it. All right. Verse 19, and when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are very, a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. See? No faith. They're not building their house on the word. Faith in God's word, the rock of his word, and the truth. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people, and I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Right. See, he's already here talking about how there's going to have to be a separation in the nation, a purging, and it's nation, singular, there. Yep. He's talking about a believing remnant that he's going to have to bring out. They're going to be looked upon by this nation that's gone away from them, that are apostate to the Lord. They're going to be looked on as foolish. Yep. Their foundation's foolish. We've got our foundation that's, that's solid and we put our hope in. We build on that. This foolish nation over here is building their house on not a sure foundation, Amen. a foolish rock. Mm -hmm. That's the way they look at them. And he said, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy with them. Verse 22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn into the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with their increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Mm -hmm. That's going to thoroughly purge that floor, isn't he? Yep. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them, divine judgment. And they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of the serpents of the dust. Poison of serpents, judgments. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. And I said, I would scatter them into the corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. The scattering, fifth course of punishment issues. Judgment of the law. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. Right? They think they're God for giving them the victory. Hmm. Whereas the Lord's actually just bringing judgment on his people for forsaking him. He says, for they are a nation void of counsel. Imagine that. People with the oracles, the law of God, they're void of counsel. Mm -hmm. Neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise and that they understood this and that they would consider their latter end. See, when you get out here to the end, there's this separation that's going on, purging them with fire. Issues of foundation. What are they building their houses upon? What's going to stand? He says in verse 30, How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? It's the Lord's judgment. 
He says, for, for their rock, the false rock of the apostate nation, is not as our rock, the true Lord, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall and clusters, and their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Notice verse 36. For the Lord shall judge his people. Judge his people. And repent himself for his servants. Right? There's his people, but then there's his servants, the remnant inside that people. When he seeth that their power is gone and that there's none shut up or left, mm -hmm. going to have to back up against the wall, so to speak, looking like they're going to perish. It says, and he shall say, where is their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? See that? Which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drink the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. Okay. Right? When God's bringing judgment and fire upon them, let your God save you. Can any deliver out of my hand? Verse 39, he says, See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. You build on the wrong foundation if you're going after those false gods. He says, For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. I am that I am. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will... Reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain of the captives from the beginning of revenge is upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people for he will avenge his, uh, the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. So ultimately the Lord's going to restore all this and do his purpose with Israel but it's not before a great judgment and purging goes on in the land. And what's going to be tried in that judgment of the Lord, as we're going to see, is that there's this, this separation, right? Wheat and chaff concept in the nation. It's got to be taking place. Purging. that we talked about there's going to be purging out here. And the issue that's going to determine which part of the nation is destroyed from among the people and which one are categorized as his servants who ultimately go into that kingdom to serve him, mm. it's going to be the issue of which foundation they're built on. What rock is your house built on? You can see this whole wisdom and foolish concept in here, the counsel, the understanding issues that he's talking about there. The Lord and his word, right? Amen. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. There's the written word, and there's the living word, and they're both typified as the rock or the foundation. When you get over here into the Gospels and this period is getting underway, where the Lord is getting ready to take the program to its end and establish his kingdom, the issue of the separation and the foundation of which doctrine you're going to be built upon is going to be a big issue in Israel. The rock, the foundation. And we're going to see this theme, and the prophets actually will pick up on this. Once they go into captivity, the, the prophets here will come along and they're going to prophesy about what's coming out here in the context of a rock and stone in association with Christ and what that's going to mean and how the remnant needs to build their house on him. Okay, So that's the next installment of what we got to look at. Tonight we're just looking at that background developing the doctrine so that we understand the rock and the foundation issues and how there's this competing wisdom in Israel as it relates to their foundation. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Yeah, that'll serve us yeah. well if we get going into the, the Gospels. You might scratch your head and say, what in the world does this have to do with Matthew or the Gospels? It might seem like that right now, but I promise you it has everything to do with it. And we'll be able to see that here in the next few weeks if you stick with me. Amen? Amen. Amen. I appreciate your attention tonight. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are grateful for these scriptures and for this word. We thank you for who you are. As God, you surely are a, a stable and steadfast rock spiritual rock and we can place our faith in you knowing that we have a sure foundation to stand on we can rely upon your word and uh, the truth that you've given us in it 
It is truly a sure foundation. I pray that you'd help us just to build our lives upon it as we rightly divide it and apply it to our lives. We give you the thanks and the praise. Thank you for these saints once again. And uh, pray for the furtherance and continuance of our study will be uh, to the edifying of your body and to your honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.